Very glad to be here. Um, I'm going to read from uh, a, a novel called um, Albert the Great, A Short History. It's about two-thirds of the way through it. It's, uh, the, the book is mostly about Albert, who's age one through five, as we see him. Uh, but this uh, doesn't really have Albert in it. It's about his mom, Lila, who um, left him in Flagstaff when he was uh, just over a year of age because she was addicted to methamphetamine, and now she's in a rehab center in Phoenix called Desert Morning. This is uh, about 2011. <clears throat> the last time Lila had seen Brenda was two years earlier, and they hadn't parted on good terms. But here she was at Desert Morning, a kindred spirit, rolling her eyes when they listened to the whining life stories in group. <clears throat> it was Brenda's attitude that made Lila smile, not her face. The face she saw hadn't improved over the last two years. There was a hollowness to the upper jaw from the teeth she had lost, and gray skin with red pinch marks scattered around like a bloody constellation. Lila didn't suppose she looked that great either. It hadn't been an empty year, but it had been pretty much wasted. She was trying to turn it around. What do you want from the program, boomed the group leader, a guy with a salt and pepper Van Dyke beard that made Lila think, pure Satan. Now he was doing the savior. Has it been working for you lately the way you're living? Do you want to work, walk out of here better than you came in? I'm a fuck up, Brenda said in her tobacco roughened voice. Her eyes were steady and she was unruffled. A court order fuck up and that's the only reason I'm here. Her failure to surrender got a smattering of laughter from the group and Lila's was the loudest. Brenda was funny. All of us are, said Van Dyke, and Lila thought, I knew he was an old burnout. Yeah, said Brenda, but the difference between me and you guys, or some of you guys, is that you're trying not to fuck up anymore. That's right. Me? I don't care. Lila knew what Van Dyke would say about that, and he did. You'll reach for help when you need it, and maybe you haven't hit bottom yet, and other similar phrases Lila had heard since Alatot's. She'd been in this kind of place before, more than once, after all, and she was fluent in the language of recovery, although she had to curb herself from time to time from laughing or rolling her eyes, just as in Alateens. She didn't fight Desert Morning's institutional routine, and after a few days, the cleanliness and order of the program had settled her mind down to a fraction of the speed and loudness. Her body stopped aching all over. That was a crazy life she'd been living, no doubt about it. Literally crazy. Better stick with the program. Keep on keeping on. But at the same time, Lila admired Brenda's honesty. At supper, Lila sat down beside her and said, I liked what you had to say. It's refreshing, really. I'm sick of these people who pretend to be oh so sorry they ever smoked meth. I love to get high, Brenda wheezed, the floral tattoo on the upper part of her right breast dancing. The one and only trouble is there's never enough. <clears throat> they were sitting together in the dining hall after lunch with a few minutes until the trust building session. <clears throat> That's true, said Lila. I've had a shitload, but I've never had enough. The two of them would <clears throat> meet out back during kitchen duty and smoke a couple of cigarettes. Explain to me about this bullshit, said Brenda flicking her ash onto the butt can, a number 10 with peeling pitcher of orange yams. What bullshit? You know all of it, trust building, sharing. More than a week had gone by and Van Dyke and the others were still leading the participants in these exercises, such as when one person catches the other falling backwards. Just once I'd like to let somebody crash on the back of their head, Brenda said. <laughs> Lila laughed and said, why? Serves them right. I mean, who in the real world thinks a stranger is going to help you? A sap. Often in the evenings, they would show a movie with a message. It was surprising how many they could find that had addiction as a theme. After a showing of Days of Wine and Roses, which Lila had seen several times, she and Brenda sat and caught up. Whatever happened to you after we lost track of each other a couple of years ago? It's a long story, said Lila. I got time. What I mean is I can't really tell it like from beginning to end. There are so many pieces missing. You mean like your memory? 
I got that problem too. Yeah, like I don't really remember what happened back then. Yeah, well, I do, but that's okay. Brenda laughed and then started coughing. It's actually a pretty boring story for the most part. Lots of shelters, lots of couches. The weirdest few days were at a so-called religious community in Sedona. You don't mean those guys that got killed in the fucking sweat lodge. Yeah, the supposedly native sweat lodge. I left in the nick of time just before that happened. When Lila had heard about how people stayed in the sweat lodge even though they were dying of heat, she felt sorry for them and those people's families, so all so far away, probably wondering why. Now they would always associate natives with disaster. Lucky you, said Brenda. I went back to Flag to see my son, and, and then something happened. I still don't really know what, but I ended back up back in the ER. OD? Not exactly. I wasn't thinking too straight. Paranoid. There was a Mexican gang after me. I mean, I thought they were after me. Just strung out then? Not actually crazy? I guess it was drug-related, but it was crazy. Genuinely insane, although it seems real. And that's how I got here. That's too bad. No, I'm lucky. I feel better. How long you been here? Six weeks on Friday. Some days it was entirely true that Lila was glad to be there, to be clean and sober and becoming determined to get on the right track, to be a mom to Albert. Other days her enthusiasm was tempered by her realization that Brenda was right. Everyone here was fooling herself, getting brainwashed with all the recovery vocabulary and depriving herself of pursuing her own happiness and danger. It had been so long already. Albert was five, and Lila hadn't seen him for nearly a year. From her childhood in churches and church-like gatherings, Lila had retained a need to think of herself as a spiritual being, even as she rejected religion. When a counselor or fellow addict called on her to reach out to God or invite him into your heart, she had scoffed at the sentimental phrases. Now she swallowed hard and considered that some form of religion might help. Her mother still believed in prayers of all sorts and had dragged them as kids to churches, peyote meetings, hand tremblers, crystal gazers, alatots, alatines, enough to pretty much cure her of all that. But she felt she needed some supernatural help to send the poison arrows back the way they came. The first week <clears throat> she was at Desert Morning, a Navajo medicine man came to speak. He was a regular there, since many of the clients were native, and even non-natives praised his spiritual power. He talked about using native ways to help with recovery, not in a very original way, but he didn't come off as a, a liar or fake. He sang a prayer from the blessing way. She thought she could trust him and asked if he could help protect her from the evil intentions of others, Dennis, for instance. Do you want me to do a prayer for you? His eye contact was much too intense. She had always been warned not to stare at people. Yeah, and at the same time, are you asking me to do evil against someone, he asked, staring? I would never. I'm just trying to protect myself and my son from whatever he's trying to do. But what was the point? Whether or not this guy was willing to use his skills, she couldn't get his help by pretending not to want it. Let me do a prayer for you, and it was very nice, just some blessingly verses that were well sung, some smoke and feathers. But he prayed for harmony, not vengeful harm, which was what she wanted. <laughs>